Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Talking Knicks. I'm here with my good friend Tom. And hey, Tom, let's talk Knicks. All right, so Tom, this week we talked pretty recently. There's only been two games since. The Knicks won a game against the Magic, snapped an eight game losing streak, and then they lost a game to the Celtics, who were the two seed in the Eastern Conference. So that's that's nothing major, but let's start with this Magic game. Uh, 120, 113, the Knicks win. First quarter of the game, the Magic came out, dropped 41 points on the Knicks. Absolutely no defense being played whatsoever. Then second half, they scored 44 points total. So the Knicks just completely turned it around, led by Trey Burke and Tim Hardaway Jr. Trey Burke goes for 26, 6, and 4. And Tim Hardaway Jr. goes for 23, 6, and 3. Both tied for the team lead in assists with 6. It's that's not bad. So uh, you watched this game. What do you think? Well, I think that the Magic are one of the few teams in the league whose point guard situation is about as dire as the Knicks is right now. And and this is actually probably worse because they're starting DJ Augustine, who's just old with no potential. Like, at least there's some upside to the Knicks point guard situation. Um, but, yeah, it, it really did uh, hurt them in this one. They turned the ball over a ton, I think. Uh, they 13 turnovers, Knicks end up scoring like 22 points off those turnovers, which is far more than they normally do, uh, getting out in the fast break and in transition. And uh, yeah, like there, there was a lot to notice in this one, just the, the first game coming back from the All-Star break. The first of which is Trey Burke going 12 for 22 for 26 points. He looked great, um, which was kind of a theme in the last couple of games. What did you, you see from Trey? Uh, Trey Burke was... He just knocks down shots. I mean, you don't – you always think he might miss just because he, he's been out of the league and you wonder, like, why was this guy out of the league? And then you see him play, and it doesn't make sense because this guy could get buckets. He knocks down threes. He just gets into the lane, pulls up. He knocks down pull-up pull jumpers just very, very consistently. When he gets in the lane, he's got an open shot. You think it's going to go in. And I know down the stretch of this game, they were going ISO to him a lot. And – I had no complaints about it. There was one time when uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. was wide open at the top of the key. Dre Burke was right next to him, and he didn't pass him. That was the only time I, I thought maybe he should pass it. But then he went ISO, and he just hit a mid-range jumper. So it, it canceled out. And then at the very end of the game, not, not the very end, like the last minute, there was one play where he basically just dribbled the ball for 24 seconds and then shot it. And, and there was no complaints about that because the Knicks were just trying to run out the clock. And they had the ball in the hands of, of the guy who won them a game. So you can't complain about that. And I, I appreciated it. Yeah, I mean, Trey is definitely the right guy for the job there. I think we'd like to see Tim Hardaway Jr. be the guy for that. But yeah. he, he struggled in this one, especially from three, just going one for six from behind the arc. Um, but I, I agree with you on, on Trey Burke kind of having some of that G League aura around him, at least in my mind. I'm thinking the same thing. Like, th there must have – like – the bloom's going to come off the rose at some point here. I think that's an expression where it's like, he, how long can he really sustain this if just earlier this year he was not even in the NBA? So, I mean, so far so good. He's looked like he's gotten to the rim very capably. His his handle looks really tight. It, he's been making a lot of mid-range jumpers too, I've noticed, which I don't know how sustainable that'll be. But, I mean, the rest of his game, it just it looks like he'll be able to keep this going. Yeah, and uh, I know Kenny mentioned Lynn Sanity as a comparison. Um, not quite as awesome because Jeremy Lynn was the greatest player anyone's ever seen. Agreed. But this Trey Burke, he's doing a little something, 26 and 23 in the two games this week, I think. But that's pretty good. Um, and, yeah. again, the other thing is I think he had a lot of – he had a, a chance to just change his game completely in the G League when you're the go-to scorer. I think he was averaging like 26 and a half – per game in the G League. And this is coming off a season where he was the backup point guard on the Wizards. And you don't you don't get the opportunity to just ball out like that. So that might have just changed his confidence in the way he approaches the game. He hasn't been doing that since he was in college. So Yeah, it looks like he's actually having fun out there for once too. So I, I did actually watch him on the Wizards last year and it was ugly. He just he didn't look like an NBA player, but it, it looks like a completely different guy. It probably is a mental thing like you said. So um but there were other guys who performed well in this one, too. I, I, th I was impressed with Kyle O'Quinn. Um, one stat I, I saw was that the Knicks 
outscored the Magic 22 to four in second chance points. And uh, I mean, that's a huge margin. Kylo Quinn had eight of those second chance points. He was he was grabbing boards. He was uh, he was six eight from the field, fourteen points, eight rebounds uh, in just under nineteen minutes. So real efficient game from him. And it, it's it's good to see him um, doing a lot with his minutes. You know, I think a, a lot of guys were a lot of Knicks fans were hoping he might get moved at the at the trade deadline. But I, I'm happy to have him on the on the squad. Yeah, the, the, you'd like to to have an asset for him, but we the Knicks fans really like Kylo Quinn. This guy just gives us all every game. He's he's kind of crazy, a little reckless. He gets a technical every now and then for just throwing somebody, but you know, comes with the territory. We'll accept it. Another guy we got to talk about was, is Frank. Uh, stats don't jump out at you, but he played the entire fourth quarter in a in a game that they won. So that's he's just very very steady when he wants to be or what, not when he wants to be. I'm sure he always wants to be with. Just when he has it, he can be a very very steady guy, and you can trust him to to play lockdown defense and just when he's not turning it over, he's a good guy to have on the court. I mean, his defense really jumped out at me when I was watching. Like, I think he swatted Biombo at least once, maybe even twice at the at the yeah. rim. Like, he just sort of stood straight up and and seemed like. He was kind of even hard to move, which is not something you'd expect from the, the skinny 19-year-old. But just he was he was locked in on D. It was, it was impressive to watch. Um, and he, he was playing a little bit of point guard and off the ball, I noticed, because he was running in the fourth quarter with Trey Burke a lot of the time, right, Greg? Uh, yeah, he was. For, and Trey for... was, being the, was the lead ball handler for a lot of the time. And Frank did fine off the ball as well. So that's promising to see. I, I'd like to see. I've said it last pod as well, but. You know, I want to see him in that primary ball handling position as much as possible. But, I mean, just to even get him fourth quarter minutes and being productive, that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, and I think he swatted Biombo once and Hazonia once. That's right. That's yeah. right. Hazonia was, was the big time one down the stretch in, in transition. And that that, uh, that was big time. Then he had a he, – he turned it over, I think, on one end, and then he – Ran back and he stole a pass on the other one when they were trying to make a, a transition pass to Miyamo. So that was good too. Then the other thing he did, he knocked down some free throws, clutch free throws down at the end. He missed one, but it was good to have him on the line for some pressure free throws. He knocked, he went two for two one time, and then at the very end of the game, he went one for two. Which I mean, obviously you prefer he make them all, but it was good for him to have some pressure. But another funny thing we got to talk about that we had this game comfortably in hand, and then. They just started to blow it again. That they were winning by 13 with a minute and 43 left, and this game got down to five points with 19.6 le- seconds left. And then minute eight or 16 seconds left, 118 to 112, and the magic inbounder just passes the ball to Lance Thomas, and the and the game's actually actually over, which was just classic Knicks, just. Almost blowing an unblowable game. It's well, it's just... funny. It's funny, Greg, because it seemed like a lot of Knicks fans, at least the ones I was following on Twitter, were almost upset at this win. Like, there's this whole idea of the the tankathon going on, and and the Magic were one of the the primary teams that we need to jump ahead of us. That, that at least it's even plausible that they may jump ahead of the Knicks uh, heading into the lottery. But you know. <laughs> this is what I, someone made the point on Twitter. Like, this is what you want as Knicks fans for the young guys to play, to play well. And if the result of that is a win, you really can't complain about that. Yeah. And I know we talked about it a little bit last pod, but how bad these teams at the bottom are. But once you actually watch the Knicks play against one of them, the Magic are really, really bad. It's pretty crazy. And I, based on the records of these other teams, I think they're also this bad. I know the Magic just traded their starting point guard, so that makes them worse right now. But all, all these teams are pretty bad, and I don't think the Knicks have a chance at getting up to to like the Magic's Magic's level. Even if the Magic beat them, the Knicks would be four games ahead of them right now. And one thing is, we need we needed the Knicks to win a game because we didn't want to end the season on a twenty eight game losing streak or whatever it was going to be. Eight eight game losing streak hurt. That was a very long time to, to not win a game. Even with, especially without Porzingis, you want one glimmer of hope in the locker room because these are actually people too, and they live their lives. And if they're just losing every single game, that's just terrible for them. They're not 
they're not going to perform well for the rest of the season or or next season. Yeah, and one one major change that we should probably talk about from this game was a, a shakeup to the starting lineup, and that was Jared Jack was taken out of the starting lineup, and not only that, he got the DNP coach's decision, didn't play a single minute. Only player, only player on the team to get that, too. Right, and he was replaced and said by the new acquisition, Emmanuel Moutier, who got uh, just under 23 minutes of play. He wasn't seeing as much of the fourth quarter run I don't think as, as uh, Frank and Trey were, but um, you know, he, he ended up having the worst plus minus on the team. Take that for what you will. Um, but his, his stat line was, was fine. He ended finished with eight points, five boards, four assists, like um, well, just the two turnovers. So it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. Um, it, it's not necessarily all his fault that the team didn't perform as well with him out there. Oh, uh, did you notice anything from his game? Uh, no, not really. I know he, he was, he's been posting up a little, which is not bad. Uh, I didn't expect that from him, I guess. I was, I was reading Nick's film school. They had a good tweet. They said that he had, I think, two or three post-up buckets his whole season on the Nuggets, and he had two or three in one single game. It might have been this game against the Magic. So it, it's interesting to see how he's going to transform his game in a, in a new opportunity. Just like Trey Burke, you go, you go from being like a backup point guard who was very reined in to unleashing the beast and you can do whatever you want. I mean, you make mistakes. That's fine. We're not in a position where we're fighting for a playoff spot anymore. So being able to loosen up the leash on guys like Frankie Moutier is good for them. They can see what they can do out there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know how much more we have left on this game. I don't want to necessarily end it on a negative note, but there were, it wasn't all good here. Like, Tim Hardaway Jr. shot one of six from three. Kind of he had the, the one hot streak last week, but uh, kind of was back to his cold shooting self here. The, the Knicks in general just shot seven of twenty five from three, which is which is pretty trash. Um, and and then, the magic the magic shot eleven for twenty four, forty five percent from three. So it's polar opposites. Yeah, and then and then one other thing is Luke Cornett getting seven minutes of action going zero for five from the field zero of three from, from behind the arc. I don't, I don't know about you. I, th- I think I'm, I'm down for a little less, a little less Luke Cornett. Yeah, I, I actually am too. And I mentioned that during the wizards game where he was just in for too long in the fourth quarter when there's an actually a close game that the Knicks could have won. And there's this guy who's been in the G league all season playing minutes. And uh, Hornacek changed that this this game, he noticed Tornasek was stri- or he noticed Cornette was struggling, so he he took him out and he sat him in yeah. the second half. But he put in Troy Williams, which was, I mean, it was a questionable decision. It worked out, but we'll talk more about Troy Williams as the show goes on. <clears throat> you ready for the Celtics game, Tom? Yeah, I, w- I will say one other thing is just we we always kill Hornacek whenever he doesn't play the young guys. So I guess we should give him a little praise when he actually does the right thing. He didn't play Jared Jack for a moment, as we mentioned before, and he gave minutes to the young guys. So hats off to, to Hornacek for that one and sort of sticking to his word, or at least all the, the talk around the youth movement of the Knicks. It's uh, hopefully going to come to fruition here. Yeah. The one thing me and you were talking about pre-pod is the minutes for Courtney Lee. And maybe this is good for the development of these young players, but this is bad for his trade value for, we're planning on moving him in the offseason. I know it's easier to move a big contract like his in the offseason, so that's what I was thinking happens at the trade deadline. You're not going to get what you want for this guy. You've still got two years. Maybe once this year is off of his deal and then other people have cap space during the offseason, it'll be easier to move him. But if you just don't play him, played 14 minutes against the Magic, that, that might be tougher to move if people aren't seeing this guy play. But – I mean, maybe maybe the half season we did have, he did a good enough job for his value to sustain itself. Well, Greg, I think you kind of nailed it. My my major concern here is just that prior to the trade deadline this season, he was playing so well in his minutes, right? And that was what was fresh in other teams' minds when they were going to go to trade for him. And yeah, like that kind of stuff can, can wear off. Like that perception can wear off if he's only getting 14, 15 minutes a game and not really... Uh, being given the opportunity to to score like he was earlier in the season, then yeah, his trade value will, def- will definitely decline. But 
you know, we can't have it both ways. Like before we were bemoaning the old guys playing and not getting enough development. Now we're starting to see the opposite of that. And, and I don't want to complain too much about the other side of the coin here, but you're right. Like there's, there's also a major risk here. So, I mean, ho- hopefully Hornacek is able to find some balance between playing Courtney Lee, his minutes showing off what he can do to, to up his trade value, or at least keep it constant and, uh, and getting the young guys experience. Yeah. And then the one last thing I'll say about waiting until the all-star break to make this change is why, why did, why, why did we have to wait until that? That's not also breaks. Not like a, it's just a symbol in Hornacek's head, I guess. But this next season just went down the drain as soon as Porzingis uh, got injured. And it was well on its way out before that. So this change could have been made prior to this. I guess it's better to ease yourself into it. It's such a drastic change. But I, I don't know. I think this could have happened earlier. But, I mean, it's here now. Can't complain. We'll move on to the Celtics game. Celtics beat the Knicks 121-112. The Knicks put up a good fight. Um, <clears throat> Kyrie Irving went off on the Knicks in the third quarter. I think he had like 15 or something points. Ended the game with 31. Knicks' best player was uh, Trey Burke once again, obviously. I think he scored 15 in the first half. Uh, main complaint some fans had was he scored those 15 in the first half and then he didn't get back into the game after halftime until 131 left in the third quarter, which, I don't know, that's a little little questionable from the guy who's, who got your team cooking. But, you know, it happens. Tom, you didn't you didn't see much of this game, but what, what are you thinking about these box scores? Yeah, well, like, I actually caught the uh, Trey Burke's made baskets, and I just wanted to see how he was getting his points. And, and like I said, it, it was, again, a – it was an instance where he's getting to the rim like a lot and, and shooting the ball very well there. And for such a little guy, it's impressive. It kind of reminds you of Isaiah Thomas from the Celtics last year. You just wonder how these little guys are able to get to the tin, absorb the contact and finish. And uh, I mean, last couple of games, Burke's been right there doing it. So I, I thought that was impressive. Again, he was, <laughs> he's, he was hitting some pretty tough contested mid rangers. Uh, they're fun to watch, and they, they definitely get the crowd going. But, I, again, I, I'm not sure if he'll be able to keep that up. Um, and then as far as what else I saw, like you mentioned Kyrie Irving going off. And one thing I remember from the first from the last matchup with the Celtics was Frank really giving Kyrie some issues. There were some highlights going around of Frank hounding Irving and making life very difficult for him. And so I was hoping to catch some more of that this time around. And I saw, again, you mentioned Nick's Film School. Uh, they, they put up a tweet showing that Frank Nilakina guarded Kyrie just for four shooting possessions. So that's four of Kyrie's 22 shooting possessions. Um, and I'd, I'd like to see that number go up, get get Frank on him for a few more um, possessions and make life harder on, on Irving. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a couple points there. What, what do you think? Yeah, the one thing that jumped out to me was Troy Williams. He came into this game um, – Still relative unknown for the Knicks fans. They saw him in the Magic game for six or so minutes. He scored two baskets, had four points. And then this game, he comes in. He looked a little sloppy in the Magic game. One of his buckets, he did like a – like a, he had a wide open three in the corner, and then he just drove awkwardly, and then he did like a cool – layup that you were like, does he do that? Or was that just like a really lucky thing? Like the reverse layup you're talking about. The Julius Irving move where you go behind the backboard and then you just do a reverse layup. One one of the coolest moves in the whole entire world. And you're wondering if this guy just did it by accident when he did it the first time. (laughs) And he comes in the Celtics game and he does the same move, like except better, and it looked perfect. And you're like, wow, this guy's really, really athletic. And then he had a, a lefty tip slam, which just Brought the Knicks bench into a ruckus. Everybody's up screaming. He felt good about the Knicks again. Uh, they got him close. I think he had another, either that one or, or a different shot he hit. Got the Knicks within three with five minutes left against the Celtics, which is impressive for this Knicks squad. And then Troy Williams ended the game six for nine shooting, 14 points and four rebounds. So Knicks fans – might be excited about this guy. We might have found something here. I know the Brockets were sad to see him go. Uh, so hopefully we'll see more minutes from him going forward too. 
Yeah, and Greg, he was he was six of six from inside the arc too. He didn't miss a single shot from uh, from two. Uh, made both his free throws, so that's nice to see. O of three from from three. So if he's gonna be like a three and D ish type of wing, uh, and maybe that's not his game at all. Maybe he's more like a a Beasley type of wing who just goes and gets buckets. <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to watch a little more of him to really understand his game. But yeah, it's good to see him just bringing energy and a little bit of aggression. And some athleticism around the rim. So and then you you mentioned his defense earlier too, uh, with this Knicks film school. We'll just keep bringing them up. They do good stuff. So if you want to follow them, we we follow them. And we appreciate what they do. So according to them, uh, and some some chart they made, he guarded Jalen Brown, and Jalen Brown shot five for five from him. No, that was the only person he defended during the game, or that's the only person that launched the shot against him at least. So maybe that's that's less than ideal. So, but you, you'll hope to see some better defense from him going forward. If he's going to be this three and D or or athletic guy that that energizes us, we don't know what we have. We don't know this guy. We've only seen him in two games, and and we like what we saw. So keep an eye on him going forward. Moody started again at thirteen six and four, which is pretty good. Uh, minus seven plus minus, but the whole entire starting unit was in the negatives. He actually had the best uh, plus minus of the starters, believe it or not, at minus seven. So, again, like Tom mentioned in the Magic game, probably not all his fault that his his plus minus wasn't so good against the starting unit. And, again, this is a a guy who's been on the bench all year starting against the number two seed in the Eastern Conference and against his counterpart, Kyrie Irving. So, nothing to complain about. We like what we saw from Moody A. so, again, point guard rotation, Jared Jack, zero minutes. That's a thumbs up. I think one thing Hornacek did was he played Trey Burke, Frank Nielakina, and Damian Dotson for a little bit. And I think that lineup did a good job. I think they were plus nine, if I remember correctly. So, watch out for lineups like that going forward. If Because of Frank's size, you can play him with two guards. Uh, maybe not Trey Burke all the time since he's, he's small, but... Trey Burke's defense in this game was actually pretty impressive. So if Burke is able to hold his own at least or just tread water on the defensive end, then we might have found something. Yeah, I mean, Burke can hopefully hang with opposing point guards and then and then slotting Neil Aquina on to shooting guards. That sounds doable to me. And, and Burke just brings some nice off-the-bounce shooting ability, right? Like there's just not a lot of guys that Knicks have had recently who can just – come off a screen and pull up from three, you know, like you, all the elite point guards from Steph to Dame Lillard, James Harden, Chris Paul, like all these guys can just pull up off of screens and hit deep shots. Jared Jack was, was pulling up from long two and just bricking with a lot of consistency. So it's nice to have a little change of pace where Burke can actually pull up for three and hit and actually be a, you know, a danger to like defenses will react to him coming off a screen while he's dribbling. That just hasn't happened in a while. Um, going back to Moutier for a second, he, he really didn't shoot the ball particularly well. He was 0-3 from 3. He's not a three-point shooter or much of a threat from there. So hopefully he can you know, get get those numbers up a little bit. He also was 5 of 8 from the free throw line. I don't know if he is typically like a, a very good free throw shooter, but that wasn't all that great either. So you know, hopefully on the offensive end he can do a little more. He, he struggled – a little bit with turnovers. He led the team with four turnovers. I watched those plays, um, and, a, and a couple of them resulted in Celtics buckets on the other end. The Celtics actually scored 20 points off of Knicks turnovers. Um, usually they score less than 15. So yeah, usually the Celtics are, are very bad at scoring off of opponent turnovers, but they uh, they put up 20 on us, which is you know enough though. That, that would be leading the league uh, right. if they were to average that. So. So, Tom, Moutier shot 78% from the line last year on the Nuggets, and he was shooting 80% from the line for the Nuggets this year. And then in, in his very limited action with the Knicks, he's shooting 63% from the line. Okay, yeah, that's probably just a small sample thing, just getting used to the arena and everything. So, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about it, but hopefully he can. Yeah, but you would like people to make their free throws. We, we hate missed free throws. Always have. Everybody does. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, Courtney Lee didn't play much. I, I don't know. There's not much here. Beasley, let's talk about Beasley for a minute because 
he always seems to have a pretty bad plus minus these days. In the Magic game, he just didn't seem to care at all about the bas- actual basketball game that was happening. He was just there jogging around, pretending to do stuff, but not actually giving any effort whatsoever. And Hornacek ended up just taking him out and leaving him out and letting Lance Thomas handle the handle the, the three, the, the small forward duties down the stretch. But this guy... Uh, it's tough to see where he fits in this uh, this this young guy action down the stretch of the season. So you got this guy who's, who seems to be purely a bucket getter, and then you want to build a bunch of young guys. And one of those young guys is Trey Burke, who is also purely a bucket getter. And Tim Hardaway Jr. is pretty much also a bucket getter. I mean, it's it's tough. You know, these guys on the Knicks don't seem to be very versatile. And no, I mean, in Trey Burke's defense, he, he did uh, finish with eight assists in yeah. this Celtics game. I think he had six in the Magic game, if that's my memory serves. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and so, like, he, he can do a little more running an offense, getting other guys involved. And and Tim Hardaway Jr., I mean, not quite as much, but, but still some. Um, Beasley's consistently putting up the zero assist mark. Uh, and I, he's the type of guy who just likes to be in the spotlight. He likes he liked when the Knicks were kind of closer to relevant earlier in the season when people were watching, the garden was buzzing. And, and he feeds off that. That's kind of part of his ego. But th- this team's not going to be sniffing relevance for the rest of the season. So I could see him getting disengaged, disinterested very quickly. Yeah, and you might – I know, I know the, earlier in the season he was getting some DNP CDs, so that, that's a possibility again. I, I don't know. Yeah, we'll and then there's also the the possibility of that lowering his trade value. What? I mean, but he's he's on a minimum. He's on a one year deal, so he doesn't even have trade value. That's true. I guess now that the the trade deadline has passed, like he could have gone for a second rounder before for a team who needed some bench scoring, but. Um, now that's off the table, yeah. Th- then there's really no reason to play him at all if, if he's not a part of the long-term plan or even next year's plan. But I mean, he could be part of the next year's plan as Porzingis is going to be out for a good amount of time. And then once he gets back, we'll be back to where we were and just move Beasley back to the bench. Because um, honestly, the, this bench, you don't know who you would put into that starting slot for Porzingis other than Michael Beasley. Uh, Lance Thomas, maybe, but I don't really like. He's he's really not an NBA starter, if we're being honest with, with ourselves. So having him replace your best player, your All Star best player, is is less than ideal. Because Beasley, on any given night, could have All Star talent. Very inconsistent. Usually doesn't have the All Star talent, to be honest. But you know, he could. That's what yeah. we like. I mean. Kenny's not here, so we can speak the truth on Lance. Um, I mean, I, I like Lance, but yeah, not not necessarily a starter quality player. Um, but the thing is, I know one thing Kenny is always concerned about is is Beasley's the potential for Beasley to limit the um, the development for some of the younger guys. Because when Beasley's on the on the floor, a, a lot of his points are scored in isolation. Mm. He's not doing it in the rhythm of an offense. He's not getting other guys involved at all. So it, it hurts when you just have guys like Frank and Trey just standing around watching Beasley go to work. As a fan, I like watching Beasley go to work, but I could see how his teammates might get fed up with it and uh, <laughs> disinterested over over time if that's just sort of his, his go-to uh, role on the team, even next year. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, I don't have much more to say about this Celtics game. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, No, just looking to see if anything jumps out. But um, no, you mentioned Dotson getting minutes and being productive in those. Um, Yeah, Dotson got seven minutes in the Magic game and the Celtics game. Hopefully we got something there. Um, We we want him to be – I think we want him to be a 3 and D guy. I don't don't even see him do anything that really jumps out at me of him getting into the lane or anything like that or being super athletic. I like his shooting stroke. I think that's why the Knicks drafted him. Um, he's just supposed to be a pure shooter. He's got a decent size for his position. He's not huge, but he, he's 
he's a shooting guard size. Um, hopefully he can defend the position. So just have a nice little shooting guard backup bench piece. Yeah, one thing that one thing that kind of surprised me. So he was plus nine in, in his six and a half minutes. He had three turnovers in that short amount of time. I was wondering how he pulled that off and how the, the Knicks were still able to go up plus nine in that time with while losing three possessions. Hey, when you're good, you're good. When you, when you got it going, yeah, why not? Just give the ball to the other team. They probably turned it right back over. Yeah, that, that probably good. makes sense. All right. So, I mean, that's all we had to say about this Celtics game. Uh, not much news on the Knicks front. Troy Williams and Trey Burke are, are two guys that we added midseason who – we got Trey Burke under a, a partial guarantee next season, so I'm sure he'll be back next year. Yeah, because the it's for the minimum, so it doesn't really matter. The next, they can just if they don't like him, they'll just tell him to go away eventually. Because so, James Dolan is rich and he doesn't care about anything. And then with Troy Williams, you just hope you he evolves into a bench piece, or or we don't know. He's young enough, so maybe he can actually be something. I don't know anything about him. I've seen him play two basketball games. And then this Joe Kim Noah situation. That's what we should talk about. I was going to go there next. It hasn't really developed much, but there was minor development. It seems like he's not going to come back to the Knicks this season. Um, him and Jeff Hornacek hate each other, I'm pretty sure, is, is to put it lightly. That's right. Honestly. And they just – the Knicks want him to leave. He wants to leave. But it's all, it all comes down to money. The Knicks are like, all right, we'll let you leave if you give us money. And he's like, no, I'll leave. You give me all my money. And they're both like, no, we don't care. And I think the Knicks really have more leverage because they they actually don't care if he's not on the team. Like They could be like, you, you can be there. You can go to your – the Knicks don't care so much to the point that they've let him be at his house for like a very long period of time in the middle of an NBA season. So what are you thinking about this, Tom? Do you think he's ever going to play again for the Knicks? If Hornacek leaves after this season, which uh, I would say he's on pace too. That's just a guess. He's got one year left on his contract, and uh, I think it's possible he stays just based on the position the Knicks are in. Uh, you don't want to – Maybe you don't want to put a coach just in a failing position to start, but that's where a lot of coaches start, so it, it, might, it also might not matter. So if Hornacek is gone, do you think Joe Kim Noah comes back next season? Yeah, there's a couple, there's a lot there. I think, first of all, I, I don't think Jeff Hornacek is going to be gone next season. Uh, all partly, right. partly for the reason that you mentioned, that um, like they'll probably want to bring in a guy to help when the Knicks are like on the upswing. But for this tank, like Hornacek might be the right guy for a tank in their <laughs> eyes. Um, I, I don't know. I, if he were to be let go, I think Noah would come back to the team and play. And probably not play a lot or not play particularly well. But I think he would get minutes at least or be around the team. Um, but since that's not happening, uh, you you said that you thought that the Knicks had the leverage. And I'm not sure I agree just because it just feels like Noah – has him held hostage a little bit like just yep. he's 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 the one making the money he's the one not doing any work to make that money and he i mean he might not have as much incentive to he has no incentive to take a buyout because he's not going to see 19 million dollars again combined for the rest of his career so i just think this is an untenable situation that noah's not going to go anywhere and that he's just gonna be on the books and like it's a reality that we'll have to live with until the end of the 2019-2020 season. Yeah. And we uh, the, the leverage I mentioned is, like you say, Joe Kim Noah has the Knicks held hostage with this contract. But either way, like if he's on the team or if he's not, they're held hostage. So might as well just keep him on the team. We're not just going to pay you money to leave. If, if we pay you money and actually have you here, that's, that's more valuable in a way, despite the fact. It's like one is more valuable than zero. Right, like Noah would have to think about what the value is to him to play basketball again, right? And then yeah. subtract that from his contract and say, this is how much of a buyout I'm willing to take. Um, and at this point, it seems like playing basketball to him is worth zero dollars. So <laughs> that's kind of yeah. where they're at. Well, right. I, I think the, the, the number in my head 
uh, this isn't this hasn't been reported anywhere, but the number in my head that he would have to agree to would be like it's like he would have to give up like twelve something million or thirteen million in that last year, so that the number in his final year of his contract would be equal to what it would be if they stretched him in the final year of his contract. But then if they stretched him, he would get all that money anyway. Whereas if he agreed to the buyout right now, he would be giving up that $12 million. So it's a little complicated, but in my head, that's the number. It wouldn't make any sense for them to eat into their cap room in two years when they could just get rid of him then and save a bunch of money. Because cap space is going to be king in a, in a couple of years when we actually want to make our move. After next season, Porzingis' rookie deal will be up. He'll be a restricted free agent. And that's that'll be the last time we're going to have cap room for probably a while because Tim Hardaway Jr.'s got his big deal until he opts out. And then Porzingis' new deal is going to take up a lot of money. So you're going to have to get rid of Joe Kim Noah during that offseason and use whatever savings you have from getting rid of him to put to to any to marquee free agent, hopefully. It's a little complicated again. I probably worded it terribly. It was, it was tough to get out. In my head it made sense, but it's it's difficult to articulate the Knicks payroll situation. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I mean they're gonna have to really hit on the young guys these next couple of years and just hopefully have rotation players who are making rookie contracts. Like that's that's the goal of good teams, like you see what the Toronto Raptors are doing now with their yeah. young guys. Um, I mean, that, that's what you need is just productive players who are making very little money. Um, <laughs> that's that's like, the goal. Like Willie Hernan Gomez. Yeah, that, that, that hurt. Yeah, but I got a funny thing to tell you. This is actually sad or funny. I don't know. <laughs> it depends on how you feel. Uh, Hernan Gomez has played three minutes for the, for the Hornets since being traded. Three minutes. Did, did he do anything in those minutes? I do not think he did. But it's, it's it's been six games, so he didn't want to be here anymore because he wanted to go somewhere and play, and they traded him somewhere, and now he's not playing because they have Cody Zeller and Dwight Howard ahead of him, and they're actually trying to make the playoffs. So sorry, Willie. I wish you could have stayed, but we've we've talked about the value of the trade and. Maybe in a couple of years, the Hornets will fall apart, and the Knicks will have gotten a pretty solid deal. They likely will fall apart, meaning the Hornets. Um, I don't even know how much of a chance they have at making the playoffs. They're four games out. Um, the, yeah. they, have to, they have to jump the Pistons and the Heat to make it. I, I don't think uh, that's a strong possibility. But, you know, I'm not uh, – do the Hornets even have a GM? I don't need to talk Hornets here. Um, <laughs> All right. That's fine. I mean, we don't have much left. Let's talk about these upcoming games next week. The Golden State Warriors tomorrow. What do you think about that one, time? Never heard of them. Never heard of them. Me neither. We'll probably beat them then. Let's... Yeah. No, I, I watched the Warriors against the Thunder last night uh, when I should have been watching the Knicks. But, yeah, like the, the Warriors, they're, they're funny because they don't really have as good of a bench as they have in previous years. Like Iguodala hasn't looked quite the same and Sean Livingston's a year older. And, um, I mean, Nick Young has been a little out, out of shape. Yeah, he's streaky. He got it going last night, which was yeah. a blast to watch. But but on the season, he hasn't been all that good. So, like, the Warriors feel kind of vulnerable sometimes, uh, especially when their shots aren't falling. Clay Thompson was, like, one of nine from three. I, don't I think know. he's one for 11. One for 11. Like, yeah. when that sort of thing happens, you think you have a shot. But, uh, you know, the Thunder are a very good team, and they got blown out. <laughs> so... It's a. Uh, I don't see that producing a victory for them. <laughs> I, I, I guess I I have now heard of the Golden State Warriors, and I guess that one will be a loss. Yeah. And just, then yeah. The, the Los Angeles Clippers on Friday. The Knicks are playing the Warriors at home, and then they're going out west for four game uh, four game stretch. Two of them. Two of them included in this week of talking next, or next week of talking next. So, Golden State Warriors were saying is a loss. Clippers probably also going to be a loss. They're they're on the upswing. They're actually fighting for a playoff spot. You thought they were uh, giving up when they got rid of Blake Griffin, but they are actually not. 
They're they may be trying harder. Actually, they extended Lou Williams for three years, twenty four million dollars, which is seems to be a pretty good deal yeah. for them. Um, it'll be interesting what that does for the market for a guy like Kylo Quinn, who is very different than Lou Williams, but nowhere near as good. I would say so. Clippers probably lost, and then the big game of the week, the the, the Kings game, the East swing Kings, game, the, the pivot game, the pivot the game. Shakes, uh, so, Kings, eighteen wins on the season. They've lost three in a row. Three in a row. Listen to these. Listen to their last five losses, Tom. Eight points to the Blazers. Five points to the Timberwolves. Nine points to the Rockets. Three points to the Thunder, and five points to the Lakers. These are close games. Yeah, man. When you're in full tank mode, that's what you want. You want to be competitive. You want to play well enough to make it a game, but to ultimately lose. And that's what the and the Kings have gotten very good at losing over the years. So um, I, I don't. I, I expect the Knicks in Sacramento. I, I still think the Knicks will probably find a way to pull that one out, um, right. but. Yeah, I, you know, at this point, I don't, I'm not in full, like, lose every game possible to get the best. I, I mentioned last year the whole, the basketball gods and, and like, doing things the right way. Like, the, the Knicks are going to play hard no matter what. And if they play their young guys and, and beat the Kings, good. I'm glad, I'm glad the, the Knicks young guys are better than the Kings young guys. Yeah. And another thing is, we have mentioned it, these teams behind us that the Magic showed us, are really, really bad, and they're not going to catch us. The Knicks are six games ahead of six teams with 18 wins on the entire season, and you want those teams to, to win 25% more games the rest of the season and the Knicks to not win anymore. Right, so, so gonna... it's not realistic for the tank to get that bad for, for New York. So, like, hoping they lose every game is just kind of foolish for me. I'm just going to go in – Hoping the young guys play well, and whatever the result is, so be it. Yeah, I think we're we're at a spot where the Lakers and the Nets may be ahead of us. Everyone else is is probably set in where they are. Um, the Nets, I only say they might jump us because if everyone else stops actually trying, the Nets have in incentive to win because they don't have a draft pick. So we don't we don't know. Um, Knicks probably not getting below the eight draft pick but may not even get that low. That's all right. I mean, I've, I've heard there's plenty of talent in this one, so uh, it's hard to complain too much about their uh, – and maybe they'll get lucky, right? Maybe the ping pong balls will bounce their way yeah. and they'll, they'll jump a few spots. You, you never know. Yeah, that's true. So let's hope that happens. We're, we're predicting a one and two week um, because, Tom, you ever seen that episode of South Park where they're playing baseball? Yeah. And they're trying their hardest to lose, and then they get to they get to a team that is like really good at losing. They like hit the ball into the, the gloves of their opponents, and they, they throw pitches, and it hits the bat while he, when he doesn't even swing, and he's holding it behind his head, and then they they just win against their will. Yeah. So and, and Randy Marsh gets into fights in the stands. Yeah, so that's what we're going to need. We're going to need Hornacek to, to get into a fight or, yep. or maybe maybe a guy like Charles Oakley to get into a fight and just make the Knicks forfeit the game. It's our only chance at, at being as good at tanking as these other guys. Yeah, my money's on Oakley. All right, well, that's all we got for this week. I think we did a good job, Tom, just me and you. Maybe, maybe a dream team. Maybe we'll cut these other guys out. But follow us on Talking Knicks on Twitter. That's where we do most of our, our talking. Uh we we write some articles a lot basketball.com but we'll try to get back to that it's it's uh it's tough we're we're sad just like the rest of you guys with what's had, what's been happening this season it's got us down but we still pod we still tweet we write articles now and then hey thanks for listening <laughs>